Welcome to my talk. Actually, uh, can we please let the slides? Okay. So, welcome to my talk. My name is Jonas Baloshin. I'm a software architect, and today we are going to discuss a lot of technique tactics uh, suitable in your projects when you deal with performance. A few things about myself. I'm also a technical trainer. I conduct trainings uh, on the Java field on performance and tuning, but also on the software architecture topics. If you want more details, you can visit my website or get in touch on Twitter. How I split the, the presentation, uh, actually I thought to, to have four layers of abstractions. We will start with design principles, we will continue with, tactic, uh, with uh, tactics, patterns, algorithms, data structures, we will reach the OS guidelines and we will close, we will end up with hardware guidelines. As we can see, the level of abstractions, it's increasing towards the design principal guidelines, but complexity, it's increasing towards the hardware level. So the aim of this presentation is basically to zoom inside of these layers and to study from performance standpoint what is a matter of interest in our applications when we deal with performance. And also I create a latency hierarchical model. It's a model that you can use in your projects, and based on, on this model, at the, the end of the talk, we will map the guidelines, the principal tactics suitable on each layer. So the first uh, layer for this uh, hierarchical model, it's the layer in regards to projects where the performance is not an ASR. What means ASR? ASR, from an architectural standpoint, means an architecturally significant requirement. So basically, uh, for this kind of projects where the performance is not a stringent ELT or quality attribute, uh, for example, the response time is several seconds, you probably don't care too much about the performance. However, there are other type of projects where the um, latency is affordable. What means affordable latency? means latency uh, that could fit within hundreds of milliseconds. For example, you send a request and your response fulfills in these hundreds of milliseconds. And for this layer, we have another set of guidelines, tactics that we are going to discuss. The things are going to be um, more funny, let's say, starting with the low, low latency projects. Because in these low latency projects, you can think of a total different set of, of tactics, patterns. It's suitable when you have to deal with response time under or around tens of milliseconds. And the last layer in my uh, latency model is the, uh, the one in regards to ultra low latency. Uh, ultra low latency means, uh, for example, latency is under one millisecond, so it's, you should be very keen on performance. And uh, as I was saying, at the end of the talk, after we will review a lot of tactics, patterns, guidelines, we will map all of them to each of these layers. But before to start, what is performance? Let's first define the performance. And to define the performance, I took a very simple definition, which is um, in Software Architecture in Practice book, a very classical book on software architecture. And it defines performance uh, as being about the time and the ability to meet some timing requirements. That's it. Now, if you, your project have the, the performance around seconds, around milliseconds, around nanoseconds, and you fulfill that response time, or you fulfill the, the throughput, it means that you satisfy this quality attribute called performance. And also, a lot of people, when they refer to performance, scalability, uh, availability, name all of these non-functional requirements. Last year, I wrote an article for the InfoQ, and I advise you as being technical guys to, to don't call it like this anymore and to, to try to use the term as quality attributes. And here in this article, I provide my rationale and my explanation why it's not an appropriate terminology to, to name performance as being a non-functional requirement. So the article is called Does IT Industry Needs Better Names? So you can easily find it on InfoQ. All of this being said, let's start with the, with the first layer, layer uh, the layer for design principles. Uh, 
First one is cohesion. Uh, we already know what cohesion means. Basically, it rep represents the degree to which element inside the package, a module, a component, whatever, work or belong together. Cohesion, it's not a new term. It's if you, for example, read articles from 80s, from 90s, they define very well the cohesion. However, nowadays, it's even more difficult to keep a good cohesion by good uh, high cohesion in, in your applications because the, the complexity of the software. As we can see in that picture, uh, if you have multiple modules uh, on different colors, basically the color represents the degree of interaction and the, the degree under they work together, it's better to bundle them together and to ship them together. Because also it's a, it's a performance talk, why it is important and why it matters from performance as well, because if you bundle them together, the things that are related and work together, um, you create a better object locality, for example. The instructions are, are, uh, are more locality friendly. And also for the CPU perspective, you become more friendly from the data caches or instruction caches. So also cohesion, it's good for the clean code principles, but also from, from the performance as well. In your applications, classes should be cohesive, classes that work together should be bundled together. However, things that are not related together, of course, they should be decoupled. The next principle is abstractions. The Dijkstra said the purpose of abstractions is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which we can be absolutely precise. In Java, we deal with abstractions, we deal with uh, polymorphic calls. For example, uh, we have a base class, we extend, we create multiple implementation, um, implementations, when, and we override some um, methods. But this uh, at the runtime, we end up in polymorphic context. And this polymorphic context, it's handled by virtual calls. And this is costly during the run, especially in the hotspot. Starting with a third implementation, for example, starting with the right triangle in our case, these polymorphic calls are not anymore optimized. And you pay the cost of the virtual call during the runtime. So uh, if, you, if you deal with abstract be very careful because the performance it's impacting during the runtime that the compiler itself needs to find the target implementation and to, to, to invoke that one. Psychrometric complexity, it's another uh, design uh, guideline. Basically, psychrometric complexity refers to the number of independent paths that your code can follow during the runtime. For example, if in your program have a lot of if-else branches, if-else branches, and if you are not predictable enough, for example, if you don't follow the same branch, you mess up, for example, the, the hardware uh, predictor, also the just-in-time compiler, um, present in the hotspot make some assumptions based on the hot branches. So less predictable you are, more pressure you put on, on the hardware, on the compiler, so you uh, actually end up with slower code. And the recommendation is to, when you write code, to help actually the, the pr processor to make good prefetching decisions by writing predictable branches or to be to, to minimize also the, the branches. Also psychometric complexity it's not good from, from clean code perspective because it's it's not very flexible, it's not very extensible your code. So a lot of implications. So measure a psychometric complexity in your projects and lower it down. We learn from high school that complexities are good. Um, for example, so, uh, there are different complexities, and lower the complexity implicitly gives us a lower service time. So it's about serviceability. But let's think a bit. We have modern hardware. We have architectures with CPUs, with multiple layer of caches. How these go hand in hand? How complexity can fit on modern architecture? And 
in regards to that, I took a very simple uh, case in regards with matrix row traversal. And in regards with matrix row traversal, with the first case, row row wise row traversal, which basically you keep the same row but you change the columns. And the second approach is you keep the column and you change the rows. Basically, the code that I wrote is just to, to traverse all the elements out of that matrix and to compute the sum out of it. And the code is very simple. Uh, the row versus column differs only by calling matrix i j versus j i. If it is column, it's j i. If we have to, to uh, check the complexity, in both cases, the complexity is all uh, n of power of 2. It's basically the same. We have two loops, one, in, uh, one being inner of the other. And what I did, I tried to test the same code with different matrix size. For example, 64, 64, 512, 1K, 4K. And what we can see in here, what I tested, it's basically the, the number of operations per microsecond. And in case of row traversal, as we can spot, it was always better. And it was not like a marginal difference. It was basically around one order of magnitude in difference. The same complexity, uh, very, very big difference in performance. And the question is why? Uh, let's take the first case uh, uh, by multiplying matrix 4K by 4K, and let's see what happens under the hood. But before going really deep into the hood, let's profile the case by adding some CPU counters, like, for example, the number of instructions per, uh, cycles per instructions, or instru instructions per cycle is the same, it's reversed, the number of uh, CPU loads, the number of CPU misses. And I repeated the same for the matrix of 4K by 4K elements, and I profiled the hardware counters to be able to get more context, to understand better what really happens. And as we can see, it is already highlighted. The number of cycles per instructions, the number of misses in the L1 data cache, and the number of misses also on the last level cache, which is the L3 cache on my, uh, in my, on my uh, hardware, and also the number of translation leukocyte buffer in terms of misses, all of them were bigger. So which concludes me that uh, at this stage, we see that in case of column traversal, we have more misses, we have more cycles per instructions. But now the question is, why is that? What really happens in comparison with the row traversal? And getting back to the theory, if we know the basics, if we know how the CPU is working, how the, the caching is working inside the CPU, when we traverse the first matrix uh, row-wise, what we have? We, for example, request the first element, and of course, first time the, when, we, when we trigger that, it is not in the, in the CPU cache. When we hit, probably it's a miss, but it is retrieved in the, in the CPU cache line because the CPU sees the, the virtual memory in chunks of, of uh, CPU cache lines. So for example, one CPU cache line has 64 bytes. So basically when you request something, the automatically the first 64 bytes are retrieved in the CPU cache line. So if you request the first element, because in the matrix, the next elements are laid out in the contiguous area, uh, mem uh, memory area, the next elements are automatically filled in the same cache line. So basically, when you request the next and the third and the fourth, they are already in, in, in the cache line. In comparison with the column row traversal, when you hit the first element, it um, the, the first line of the cache is populated with the elements from the first row. However, you read only one of them, and it's very 
uh, inefficient because you, you basically get one CPU cache line, we read out of it one element and it is evicted later on because you, you do a column row traversal, you change the, the lines actually. And that's why basically it impacts the number of misses, uh, it slows down the, the, the number of instructions per cycle. And this is an explanation why we have difference in performance between the, the first row traversal wise versus column wise traversal for the same data structure, different patterns of accessing the elements. Which concludes that on modern hardware, the service time is highly impacted by, by the caches. The caching its effect is very powerful, but we should be conscious how to benefit out of it. And the bigger complexity might be a win for huge data sets where CPU caches couldn't help, actually. And the recommendation for you is to reduce the code footprint as small as possible, to, to create sm short methods uh, with less branches, and also to minimize the number of indirections, because it's not the same as having an array of objects versus an array of primitives. At this stage in Java, we don't have value objects, so we have to pay the cost of indirections. And also the complexity impacts the serviceability time, of course. And uh, during the runtime, there are a lot of optimizations, like, for example, loop unrolling, which unrolls the loop in order to, to minimize the number of, uh, of jump instructions or inlining, which also affect the the, the code in itself. The next one, it's, uh, the next layer, it's about tactics, patterns, algorithms, and data structures. The, the, in, in, in regards to that, the caching is the first one. So from a performance perspective, uh, being a performance architect, caching is one of the, the first thing you should keep in mind when you want to improve the performance, because it's very handy in essence to, to add a cache. However, it's difficult to configure and to tune it properly. So it's easier to edit, but it's difficult to tune it properly. Why is that? Because you, you have to know about data patterns. For example, uh, if your cache is configured based on a read-write-through policy, I mean, it is synchronously, uh, it is synchronized, uh, synchronized with the persistence. So all the reads and writes are synchronized with the persistence. If you use write-behind, which means all the writes are asynchronously propagated to the persistence, if it is read -ahead, Head. So you should know, based on your application, what, what, what is better in your case. And also the eviction counts a lot because, of course, the caches are limited. So they are, there is an eviction algorithm for the stale data. And the eviction should be properly tuned if it is a least recently used, policy, last, uh, least frequently used, FIFO, and so on. And also the fetching strategy is important because, for example, if you have a lot of static data, right, why not using a prefetch strategy? Because prefetch strategy adds everything in advance and because it's not dynamically static, like, for example, images or uh, whatever, which doesn't change a lot, why shouldn't you tune for with a prefetch strategy? Or on-demand, because on-demand says if it is not in the cache, if it is a uh, cache miss, retrieve it from, from the persistence or from the source itself. Or predictive, for example, based on some predictable patterns, the way you access it and the way you request elements out of it, it should be predictive. It should uh, uh, fetch in advance elements, li like how the, the CPU uh, prefetcher works. And also typology is extremely important. In my experience, typology can, may, may be a bottleneck. Um, for example, if you deal with applications where scalability, where availability is important, if you don't properly tune the caching, the topology, you end up with a bottleneck. And in regards to that, you should think what's better. Uh, it should be partitioned, should be distributed, should be partitioned, replicated. How many replicas, for example? Um, so all of these things you should think of in order to properly tune your caching. Because as I was saying initially, it's easy to, to add caching, but it's more difficult to properly tune it in, in regards to your quality attributes.
And batching is another tactic. Uh, batching, in essence, minimizes the number of round-trip round times over the network because you basically bundle the request, wrap it, and send it over the network. Also, uh, batching, at the first glance, it might seem uh, very easy. However, if you dynamically tune it to benefit out of the maximum batch size in regards with the receiver's um, rate, and also the, the round trip time, because you, uh, you need also to keep a lower round trip time if you maximize the, the batch size, in the same time to don't float, to don't suffocate the, the, the receiver rate, and also to benefit out of the maximum bandwidth. So there are a lot of parameters you should take into account and you do batching. It's not just like wrapping uh, requests together and send them over the network. If you want to squeeze out of the performance, you should think of all of these parameters. And I will advise you to read the BBR congestion control algorithm. Uh, it's developed by the guys over there, and it's a very good algorithm that tunes during the runtime your batch size in order to, to benefit out of, uh, out of the maximum bandwidth and to uh, have a minimum round trip time. So it's quite interesting and you can apply it in your applications. Martin Thompson said, designing asynchronous by default and make it synchronous when it's needed. And this is a very, very good recipe because if you design asynchronous, you send, for example, a request to a, a, a remote source and meanwhile you can handle any other task so you are not blocked. And once you are notified with the response, you can resume the work. Also, I would add on top of that, if you design uh, asynchronous and stateless, you can scale incredibly well because you don't have state, everything gets synchronous, so your application scales very well. In Java, the API to design asynchronous uh, is the Flow API, uh, added since, uh, since 9, but also there is a completable future or future uh, that you can create and play with them in order to, to uh, follow on this asynchronous uh, programming paradigm. Memory access patterns are very, very important. In essence, there are three ways of accessing the memory. The first one is striding. What, with, what means striding? Basically, you, uh, you follow on a predictable pattern based on a constant stride. For example, you have an array, and you access the elements of that array based on constant stride, incrementing 1 plus 1 or plus 2, and so on. The second case, it's spatial. What, what is spatial? Spatial means that the objects closer to the objects that I requested are likely to be requested. And as I was saying previously, when you retrieve something, the, the full cache line is filled. If you request one object, there are more chances the, the, the one next to it to be already filled on the CPU cache line. So that's why spatial is important, because once you request the, the next one, one, it is already pre-filled in the cache. And Temporal says that I, I randomly walk to the entire heap, and there are changes the elements that I requested before to be requested again. And in this regards, probably they are already in the CPU cache, because I already requested them before. So if I request them again, they might be already there. I created a small test scenario. What I did, I created um, a long array uh, of primitives, uh, of course, and the size of it was 2 gig over size of long. And I created the JVM, I started actually the JVM with with four gig of heap memory. And I had three test cases uh, in order to traverse the elements out of that long array based on stride, based on spatial, and based on temporal. And as you can see, in case of stride, it was always better. It was around one nanoseconds per operation, which leads me to think that the elements were already pre-filled in the fur L1 CPU cache. So uh, it's, it's very, very performant. In case of spatial, it was around 4.4 .4 nanoseconds. So probably L2 was also invoked. And temporal, it's around 37. Probably around, uh, the, the L3 cache was invoked because I randomly walked to the heap and I wasn't predictable. And the elements were evicted. So, uh, they weren't in the L1, neither L2. Uh, 
So as you can see, the way you, you access the memory counts a lot. And let's take an example uh, uh, in regards to the hash map, which, is, uh, which could be implemented based on the chaining and open addressing. The chaining we have in, in JDK, the, the, the implementation, it's based on chains. Uh, actually, you have the hash map, and it, uh, I, I, internally it has the table structure, uh, you have the buckets, and every time you add an element based on the hash code, it is linked to the internal array. And uh, top right, you can see the memory layout. Then, later on, when you add another one, uh, it's actually created, um, the, it's computed the hash code, and it is added to that table array. And as you can see, because elements are linked directly um, uh, from, from the array itself, they might be somehow collocated. There is no guarantee that they are collocated, but they, are, they might be closer. However, if you add the third element, uh, and this element, based on the hash code, has a collision with the fourth one, because we uh, are using the chaining implementation, a chain, basically a, a list, it's created to store all the elements uh, corresponding to the same bucket. And in this case, there is, uh, it could be spread all over the, the heap. And in this case, uh, getting back to the initial theory, we might end up with temporal memory access when we later on want to access those elements because they are spread all over the places. There is no guarantee. However, GC, after a full GC, they might be compacted, but still it's, it's not predictable. In comparison, the open addressing, uh, what does open addressing? Open addressing doesn't use the, the chain, the, the linked list. It adds all the elements inside the internal array as follows. First one, uh, if we add the, the first element based on the hash code, it is added. The next one, it is added as well, no collision. However, if you add the third one, and this one has a collision with the first, because we are using open addressing uh, scheme with linear probing. Linear probing is basically a mechanism to find the next available slot. So in, our, in my case was hash plus one. So it basically searches inside the, the array one by one the next available slot. So once it finds something, it maps the, the element in there. So in this case, the memory layout keeps more compacted, as we can see uh, in, in that uh, top right memory layout diagram. So we are closer to the sequential memory access patterns in this case. So keeping the things together, compacted, um, adds a lot of improvement. So open addressing might be a good alternative when you search for this kind of data structures and you want to squeeze the ultimate performance. Lock-free algorithms. Basically, lock-free algorithms uh, guarantees there is um, um, system-wide progress in your application. So basically, there is no situation that one thread can indefinitely block another thread because it might happen if you, for example, own a lock and uh, that thread, I don't know, goes to parking or it is, uh, uh, or it dies or it exits and so on. And in this lock-free programming uh, paradigm, uh, there is is no such scenario. So basically, a lock-free algorithm satisfies two properties. All the things happen in a specific correct order, and they happen atomically. These are two, two important characteristics. However, to reason about log fee programming, you need to have also the hardware support because it needs the state machine. Without that, it's, it's difficult. One of the simplest um, primitives to achieve log free algorithms is compare and swap or compare and set. What means compare and set? So basically, uh, I'm able to update something atomically from, from the memory actually if I have the if I know the latest state of it uh, in practice there are two threads um, and each thread wants to update the value 99 and one thread has the latest value of it 99 and the other has 98 of course only the the first thread succeeds the second one which has a stale value 98 
fails and what it should do later on, it of course reread it again and tries to, to compare it and update it um, atomically. This is one very uh, handy primitive to, to play with log free algorithms. On x86, uh, uh, it is implemented by, by compare exchange instruction, assembly instruction. However, as, as I was saying previously, you need the harder support, and this might differ from platform architecture to platform architecture. In Java, the API to play with this, for example, the atomics have the compare and, sweat, uh, compare and set method. There are also data structures like reentrant log, like concurrent link queue that are based on these paradigms and they are more on the log-free programming techniques. And also uh, another one from atomics like get and increment, get and decrement, get and set, they are using under the hood compare and set or compare and swap operations. The next one is cache oblivious algorithms. What means actually a cache oblivious, uh, oblivious algorithm? Cache oblivious algorithms um, benefit of the, of the way we traverse the data structure and how the data structure is laid out in the main memory in order to be more CPU cache friendly. Because if you have a, a miss, if you request something which is not in the CPU cache, you end up in a CPU miss. And the miss effect, it basically says that something is retrieved from the main memory and it is filled in that CPU cache line. And there are a lot of algorithms, a uh, few of them, for example, like matrix multiplication, matrix transposition, sorting, funeral sorting, it's one of them. They play really good independent of the CPU uh, cache length size, because this is the advantage. You are agnostic on the CPU cache line size, but due to the way you traverse the, the data structure and how you access it, the memory access patterns, you are very friendly from, from the CPU cache perspective, of, of course. Object-oriented programming. Uh, we learned that object-oriented programming is good. I, I won't say that. It's not. Um, so we, we learned that. However, let's take as an example the following case. Uh, we have an object, which is an account, which bundles a lot of fields inside. And we have a list of them, a list of those accounts, and we traverse all of those accounts. And for each account, if it is not active, we trigger an event. This is the code, very simple. From the OP perspective, it looks very clear. However, however, as you can see here, um, account is active can cause a data uh, cache miss. Why? Because you traverse the, the objects, the, the accounts objects, and you have to get all of them in the CPU cache line. So of course, the number of misses is increasing. In Java, for example, if the just-in-time compiler can optimize and inline the is active by just adding the field, you probably um, are in a better situation. But if it is not possible to inline, you actually increase the number of, of, the, uh, of misses. From the CPU perspective, how it looks like when you, for example, request an object from the heap, you basically retrieve it in the CPU cache line, the first 64 bytes out of it. So you can see everything is laid out into the CPU cache line, but you actually just ask for one field out of that, which is a Boolean field, is active or not. And then the entire CPU cache line is evicted. So you basically retrieve a lot of information in the CPU cache line, and you also evict a lot of lines just to retrieve one field. And if I ask you, if you reason about this model, how you change it? Data-oriented design, it's an alternative for that, and data-oriented design packs the objects in the way you read it and you write it, in basically how to use them. And to refactor that, basically you can create a Boolean, of the, a Boolean array of those fields, and if you for example, traverse all of them. Uh, in this case, you can trigger the events for one that are not active. And how it looks like in the CPU cache line, you basically, it's like in, in traversing an array where you, you hit something and you have already the next element in the same CPU cache line to basically minimize the number of misses. So in essence, data-oriented design, it's a good practice which focus on how the data is read, uh, read and written um, in as opposite to OOP design, and it 
it's useful, for example, in computer gaming when the people are very keen on performance and they really care about the number of misses and the number of, of cache lines which are evicted actually uh, for nothing. The next layer is in regard to OS guidelines. The first clue in that is thread affinity. What is thread affinity? Basically, when, you, when the threads are scheduled, they are bound to some specific course. However, due to an interrupt, they are dis, uh, descheduled and might be rescheduled again. The question is if they are uh, rescheduled again on the same core or the same core ranges, you benefit of the CPU caches because if it, if it migrates to another core, or, of course, you don't have caches. You, uh, you, when you request the new information and again and again, you end up with misses initially. So the thread affinity says that why not to bound my threads to some specific cores, in essence, to benefit out of the CPU caching effect. In Java, how you can do that? Uh, there is a library called uh, Thread Affinity. You can Google for it. However, uh, it's quite restrictive because Java uh, works on a high abstraction. In Linux, for example, the task set command line uh, help you to use that. Or if you are playing with uh, C, why not use directly sketch uh, underscore set affinity. You can set the PID and the mask and so on. So it's, it's very handy and natural. The next one is non-uniform memory access. What it says, uh, this one, basically the, the location where my object is in the memory impacts my response time. For example, if uh, my thread is it's on core zero on the, on the right socket, and if I request something from the main memory and that one is on the remote uh, memory, uh, like you saw in the picture, what we have, you pay the cost, the round trip time cost for the interconnect uh, between those two sockets until you get that information. So basically, it will be more efficient to be able to uh, use only local memory, local to your socket, local to the thread itself. And this is a non-uniform memory, uh, memory access. In Java, uh, if you st uh, uh, start the JVM, to be able to, to start with a new malware collector, so basically it's a, it's a GC collector uh, that knows how to work with these NUMA architectures, you can use NUMA flag. However, keep in mind that it's only one collector which does that, which is parallel GC. However, we know that starting JDK 9 is G1, right? G1 is default. And G1 is not a new malware collector. So uh, you might reason yourself, it's quite limited, the support for new architectures in the JVM. Um, and there is a JEP, uh, JEP for that in order to improve the G1 to be new malware collector. Currently, if you want to, to, to run your application and if you want to tune it for the new architectures, you have to switch back to the parallel GC, or here in Linux, you can use the NUMA control command line. Large pages. Um, large pages, what means um, in essence? Every time when you do a translation between the virtual address to a physical address, it happens all the times. First, you have to, to do a search inside the TLB, inside the translation locusite buffer. What is this buffer? It's basically a cache which stores the mappings between virtual addresses and physical addresses. Why is that? Because first of all, of performance, you minimize the translation process. If, it isn't, if, if this mapping is, is in, uh, within TLB, it is just returned. Otherwise, you have to walk the page. So walking the pages in order to compute the, the physical address, it's very costly. So in essence, it's preferable to have a lot of hits inside the TLB. However, this is not possible, of course. And the choice is either increase the TLB to be able to store more mappings, either increase the pages. 
First one, it's not a, a good approach because the hardware providers that, uh, are very, very keen on keeping the TLB uh, on a specific size to not me, uh, maximize the, the response time when you uh, look up inside the TLB. So this one, it's not very handy. The next one, increasing the pages uh, becomes a solution because, for example, if you request a lot of objects and those objects fall inside the same page, bigger the page, more TLB hits you have. And in, uh, in all, all, most of the, the, the operating system, one page is 4K, but of course you can put it like 2 meg and so on, so you can increase it. In Java, um, when you start the JVM, there is a flag called use large pages. However, if you start with this, it doesn't work unless you have uh, OS support. In Solaris, I think it's already enabled, the, the large pages. Uh, in Linux and Windows, you, you can explicitly enable this. And the recommendation is because it's not a panacea, it's not like if I'm using large pages everything will be good and uh, will be more performant. It depends on your application. It is suitable, actually large pages, it's suitable for applications with intensive memory within large contiguous uh, memory areas. For example, if you have a lot of accesses from the virtual memory, but all of those falls into a contiguous virtual memory areas. However, a first clue, because initially you don't create large pages, the first clue is do a profiling, profile the, the counters, take a look over the TLB misses and the TLB page walks. And if you spend a significant time in those, then you get back and think of, of uh, enabling, enabling large pages. Otherwise, probably there is, there is not in that direction the, the initial cause. And in comparison to the, when it's good to, to enable large pages, it is not recommended for the applications where you have a small working set uh, or applications with large uh, accesses, but they are very sparse. Because if they are very sparse across the entire heap, you will still, they fit in this different pages and probably you'll still uh, face a lot of TLB uh, misses. RAMFS and TempFS, uh, it's useful to, to rely on RAMFS and TempFS if you have a lot of intensive I operations. Uh, for example, when you do logging, when you do auditing, some databases might enable this. And just to give you an idea how much faster it is, I created an experiment on my hardware, on my uh, laptop, for example. What I did, I sequentially tried to read write 8 gig in chunks of 4K or 512Ks using SS, uh, HDD, SSD, and RAMFS. Uh, writing, reading in chunks, sequentially. And as you can see, the RAMFS was was better, but like, for example, 10 times sometimes, uh, 10 times uh, in comparison with SSD. Uh, even SSD, it's, it's faster than S uh, HDD. So this is another clue you should think of. If you have a lot of uh, intensive I operations, why not enable RAMFS or TempMFS uh, on, on your Linux box, and the, the, the throughput will incredibly uh, increase. The last layer, it's about hardware guidelines. First one, it's fault sharing. Um, let's suppose you have an, an object, a fault sharing object that has two variables, x and y. You create an instance out of it and you have two threads. First thread which increments x and the second increments y. If I would have to ask you, is there any contention on that instance, you probably will say no, which is perfectly reasonable. However, the way the CPU is built um, and the, the way that instance is laid out in the, in the CPU cache line, there is a false sharing, pat um, false sharing policy. False sharing is basically a CPU uh, side effect. What happens when the first thread writes something on X, uh, because X and Y laid on the same CPU cache line, it needs to get the ownership for that CPU cache line. It updates X and invalidates all the other copies for all other threads, for all the other cores. 
when the second thread, uh, the one that uh, writes on Y, needs to increment Y, it needs to get the ownership for that line. It needs to get the latest update from the previous thread, which updated X, and then increments Y and invalidates all the other copies. So there are a lot of back and forth messages in order to request the ownership for, for that cache line with X and Y, invalidate the other copies, and propagate the, the updates. And this is the full sharing um, pattern. In Java, to be able to get rid of it, there, is, there are many ways. Um, one of those is very simple to use the contented annotation. So basically, contented annotation um, uh, puts X and Y on different lines. And I created a test with two threads. And as you can see, in case of contented, the performance was around triple in, as opposed to, to the baseline, where we ended up in, uh, with a lot of fault sharing. The guideline for you to keep in mind about these fault sharing patterns is like, Think of your code. Think the way you, you created the, the objects and the fields. Also be careful because uh, Java reorders the fields. So the order you declare in your, uh, in your class, it's not the order uh, during the runtime. However, if they, the, those fields fall on the same cache line and there is a concurrent access um, for, for the same cache line, and there is at least one writer, because the one writer should be, uh, should be there. And with a high frequency of reading updating, there you, you suffer out of false sharing. If it is not of high frequency, it's still false sharing, but probably you won't notice it, because it's, it's not impacting your throughput, for example. SSDs. Um, SSDs are good, however, it's, it's important to be aware how to properly tune the SSD. Uh, two guidelines I share with you in regarding to, to, to trim and to properly choose the I.O. scheduler. What is streaming? For example, if you, write, uh, if you want to, to remove something, uh, it is not scrubbed at that time, but that area is marked as, as, as being free. Later on, when you want to remove something, um, the thing is that SSDs cannot, for example, scrub only one, uh, only that, that uh, information. So it scrubs the entire block of the information. Uh, and in practice, this block would be like uh, uh, 512 kilobytes. So basically, when you scrub something, the entire block is scrubbed. If you enable trim, you basically clean that information in advance, so you don't pay the cost of scrubbing later on of the entire block. So enabling uh, trim on your SSD, it's one uh, option. And the next one is to have a look of, on the IO scheduler. And in Linux, uh, in, in few distributions, the, the, there are three uh, options, like NOOP, Deadline, and CFQ. What I did, I basically uh, tried to test all of this on, on my laptop, and I created a test scenario to sequentially uh, read-write uh, 32 gigs in chunk of uh, 512 kilobytes on my SSD. And as you can see here, I measured the read-write throughput, and in all cases, the NOOP scheduler performed better. Um, that line is similar to the NOOP. I think if I'm, if, if I'm not uh, wrong, the deadline is, is default. Uh, however, if you want to benefit out of the best uh, performance, but only if you have SSD because it, it doesn't fit well on uh, HDD, you should enable the NOOP scheduler. And on top of this, if you have as well trim uh, enabled, as you can see, uh, NOOP with trim achieve better uh, throughput for your SSD in, in Linux. So uh, you should keep this in mind um, in order to, to properly tune your SSD, because by default, they are not configured like this. The C states is basically the, the last one. Uh, how, uh, what, what says C states? Basically, it, it clocks the signals for your CPU in order to save the power. Uh, saving the power, because the hardware profilers and all the bias settings are configured to save the power. And C states, it's one 
approach, which basically uh, says that if there is no activity on some specific cores, it clocks down the signals in order to save the power. However, if the scheduler assigns some tasks on that core, of course, the, the, uh, the, the core should be wake again and start to, to process. And these timings uh, between uh, it, it's waken up and be fully functional cost uh, because it's not very efficient if you work in, in applications where the performance should be very predictable and very steady in essence. And it is recommended also to disable the C states. Of course, you will use more power, but you are more predictable because your, your course will be always in C0 state. Uh, even if there is no activity, you still can some power, but when there is activity, you are more predictable in terms of response time, because you don't wait until the CPU gets back, it it's, uh, wakes up, actually. So all of this being said, let's get back to the initial latency hierarchical model and see, based on what we learned during this presentation, which of those we can map to each layer. So in the first case, when the performance is not an ASR, it's not an important attribute in your, uh, so you basically don't care too much about performance, still keep on writing small and clean methods. Be careful with psychometric complexity, uh, be careful with the cohesion, and also pay care with the abstractions, with the, uh, how, how many abstractions you create. If the um, latency is affordable, uh, why not uh, be careful with the data structures, with the algorithm complexity, you try to use batching, try to use caching, but keep in mind what I was already told you. It's important to properly tune them, not just to use them. Low latency, uh, if, you are if you play with low latency constraints, Memory access pattern counts a lot. Uh, lock free, why not? Asynchronous, stateless, you can use RAMFS, you can use TEMPFS. Also, you can tune as well the GC and the, the object lifecycle in order to, to uh, minimize the number of full GCs and so on. And ultra low latency, uh, here you can use everything else. Thread affinity, NUMA, large pages, be careful with fault sharing. You can, why not, refactor in your code based on DOD approach, C states, everything else. This is uh, um, an open world. You can tune whatever the OS uh, you want. Uh, just before to finish, I would say that the performance is simple in that sense. You just have to be aware of everything because depending on your application, it really imposes a lot of knowledge. Thank you very much for attending this talk. It was quite an uh, impressive audience. If you want to read more, I would advise you first to, uh, to read Ulrich Drepper papers. They are very, very good papers, and you'll understand a lot about the hardware. I won't say you should be an expert in understanding hardware, but it's important to know the basic things. Also, the algorithms and data structures are important. And in terms of, of videos, tutorials, uh, Kirk Perpendine has a very good performance methodology, mind map. Scott Mayers have a very good presentation for CPU caches and so on. So thank you very much, and if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, let's test the mic. Okay, it's working. Uh, I have a political question. Where we need this ultra low performance uh, with all this hardware tuning and OS level tuning and so forth and abusing Java for data oriented design because we all know that it all started being object oriented first. Uh, do we need Java then? Isn't it properly to change the platform, the language and so forth? Um, the answer could be yes or no. Uh, you can still use Java if you know how to properly code. For example, the, the, the Martin Thompson's uh, achieved a very, very good throughput uh, also in Java. But it, it, he, he is aware of a lot of hardware implications, how to properly use the data structures. Yes, you can use Java as well if you 
are aware of everything and the implications, or why not you can move towards uh, C or C++. So it depends on, on your knowledge and what you want to achieve, actually. I wouldn't say you should exclude Java. I would say you should carefully code having all of this in mind and all the implications. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, I've got a question about um, measuring the CPU cache misses. Uh, is there a way that we can separate those misses that uh, are coming from our application? Because we know we are working in a multitasking environment. Yes, it is. Uh, for example, if you want to be very, very specific and isolated, first, you can isolate your cores out of the rest of the world, I mean out of the OS, out of other applications, then you can use affinity for your process to be bound only on specific cores, and in this way you are completely sure that nothing else is scheduled, but, but at the end you will still have uh, interrupts on that one, but you don't have any other applications. So yes, more accurate way uh, is this one. Isolate uh, cores, schedule only your application on those cores using the commands I mentioned about, and then try to measure the misses, and it's more accurate. Is there any tool that we can use for this? Or? It's not one specific tool. There are a bunch of co uh, Linux command lines, like, for example, um, uh, the ones that I said, uh, task mm -hmm. set, uh, like CPU sets, like uh, thread, uh, task, uh, thread affinity, and so on. So uh, I advise you there is a good presentation. Uh, it's on where it gets in the way. And it's very, very handy and responds completely to your application, uh, your answer. But it is. OK, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Um, my question is, uh, would we need uh, to do data-oriented design <clears throat> if we do get uh, value objects in the JVM in the future? What do you think? Um, they are not exclusive. Uh, value objects basically um, are, are like the structs. But if you, if you, for example, have a struct and you access only one field and you evict it out of the cache line, it's still, it's still not good. So it's, it's not like having uh, value objects uh, and uh, DOD. They are not exclusive. They are complementary. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much then.